Take God's word today, and we're going to go to the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, Timothy is in a unit, uh, of, it's in a section of books in the New Testament. We call these the church letters uh, or pastoral epistles. And you have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and it really talks to you about what church should be like, uh, how to behave in church, how to uh, discover church leaders and to set them apart to give us leadership. Tells us that we uh, are to love the widows, take care of the widows. A lot of good stuff in these books, in the, the three books called the Pastoral Letters. And also it talks about generosity in the church. And we're in a series in the month of February, we're calling it Live Life Wide Open. And so each Sunday, we're uh, spending time in the scriptures, and we're learning about what a generous life looks like. So if you missed last week, try to watch it online or on Facebook, you can see the entirety of the teaching. But basically, when we introduced generosity, we said it means a, a few words in the Bible. One meaning is to saturate. So it's like a towel that's dry, and you, you wet the towel, and it gets real heavy. You pick up the towel, and it's just dripping. It's just drenched and dripping water. That's a picture of generosity. Another picture of generosity is overflowing. So it's like if I have a pitcher of water in a cup, and I'm pouring water in the cup, and it overflows to the brim and goes all over the floor, that's another picture of generosity. Another picture is you're always ready to distribute or give. And I gave the illustration about I carry breath mints with me. And if you're in the need of breath mint, I'm going to generously bless you. I'm going to be ready to distribute and pour like 112 in your hand to put in your mouth to you know, sweeten your breath a little bit. So that's another word for generosity. And then the fourth word we learned is on the fingertips, on the fingertips. And it means that everything in your hand, God put it there and you're to use it for him. So you're wide open for God to bless and use your life in a powerful way as you live generously. So this morning, I want to teach you about loving generosity. Loving generosity is our message today and how appropriate to talk about love and generosity on Valentine's Day. Now I've had to practice that because my entire life I have called this day Valentine's Day. So please don't give me a cheesy email that I said it wrong. I hear you. It's just something I've been saying all my life and I've been practicing. It's not Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so, you know, this is a day that we show lots of love, right? So if you're a man in the room and you have not bought your sweetheart a Valentine's Day, I can make you a sweet deal. See me after the service. It's going to go up. Tell me one of the most stressful sights. It's when you walk in Kroger or Publix or Walmart on Valentine's Day and you see a sea of men and they're looking at the cards that are left. The only thing left is Mother's Day cards. You're in trouble. And so if you need a sweet deal, I'll help you out. So on Valentine's Day, it's all about generosity. So if you're forced to give flowers to your sweetheart, if you're forced to give flowers to the one you love, you love, there are issues because this is not force. This is free. This is, this is out of love. You're being generous when you give flowers and then the chocolates. So when I was a boy, my dad would bring my mom home something similar to this. It was really, really big. Back in that day, it looked like uh, a, a tuxedo on the front of it. Y'all remember those? Real fluffy and ruffly, you know, back in a long time ago. So anyway, you open them up and my poor mom, six kids, I don't think she ever got any chocolate. We devoured it. Now, this was before they inserted a road map in there. You know what I'm talking about? Today, you know, it's like, uh, it's like you got this treasure map. It tells you what's what. But back before then, I mean, it was just the theology of Forrest Gump. You know, life's like a bunch of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get. But we had a way of discovering. He did say that, right? I thought he said that. Uh, but we had a way of discovering if we wanted it or not. We didn't have the map. We just use our thumb and we would just kind of press down on what 
was in there, and I'm not into nuts. I, I, I like jelly in there, okay? So if it's raspberry or orange, I call that one. So, you know, you would just press down and you'd see what you got. So here on Generosity Sunday, we are talking about Valentine's Day. That's what we're celebrating today. But we have an opportunity to talk about loving generosity. So whatever you do for someone in a car to Valentine, taking them out to lunch today or supper, you are showing what we're teaching about. So I just have to tell to everyone this online in the room, you already do this. So some of you are going to be affirmed in the message today. And then some, they need to take a step and they need to grow in their generosity. Maybe you grew up in a home and it wasn't very generous. And God's going to teach you today with our open Bible what it means to love generosity. Now, did you catch something? I didn't say I'm going to show us today how to love money because we don't need any help with that, right? That is our default setting. All of us love money. I'm going to move these flowers because I need to look at you folks on that side. I'll bring them back in a little bit. So we, we don't need to be taught to love money because we're good at that. You know what? I mean, loving money, it's kind of like the old Willie Nelson song, You Are Always On My Mind. And money is always on our mind. Every, I can guarantee you this. Don't look at me like you are confused right now. Because every day of your life, you touch money, you think about money, or you talk about money. So we always are thinking about money. Money is just something that, you know, all of us have an affection toward. Um, I read this quote. It's on the screen behind me. Only kisses and money can be so full of germs and yet so popular. And that is so very true. So I'm going to teach us today from an open Bible, not how to love money, but how to love generosity. Is your Bible open? So look with me at 1 Timothy 6 at verse number 10. Hear God's word today. For the love of money, there it is, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, the craving for money. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows or pangs. And so what the word is teaching us today, we need to love generosity. And when we love generosity, it will protect us from loving money. You're like, oh, but I want to love money. Really? You've been deceived if you think that's a good thing. Because if you look at our passage again, look at all the negative descriptors for loving money. He says, again in verse 10, for the love of money, it is a root of all kinds of evils. So when I think about root, I think about the root sin, you can break all 10 commandments with the love of money. Think about that for a moment. You can break every one of the 10 commandments and they can be money or materialism or greed related. The love of money, the, the, the phrase love of money it means affection for silver, affection for silver. A couple years ago, I preached to our middle schoolers and I brought a message out of 2 Kings. Maybe you're a middle schooler, you're a high schooler now, but you remember this message. And I was talking about this guy named Gehazi. Most of the kids didn't even know him. Gehazi was an assistant for the prophet Elisha. And Elisha, by the hands of God, did a miracle in a man's life named Naaman, who had leprosy. And Naaman's leprosy, God took it away. So Naaman wants to give Elisha some money for the miracle. He gives him a bunch of silver. And Elisha says, dude, you can't buy miracles. You can't buy salvation. You can't buy the power of God. I'm not taking your silver. Gehazi couldn't believe that his boss turned down the silver. So Naaman said, okay. And he moved on down the road in his chariot. When Elisha turned his back, Gehazi chased the chariot down and said, Mr. Naaman, Mr. Naaman, my boss sent me. He changed his mind. 
He thinks we need your silver. He thinks that silver will help us do ministry. So I'm going to take it. And he gave Gehazi the silver. Gehazi went and hid it. But here's the deal. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. Secrets always come out. And it came out and Gehazi was rebuked, but also judged. And guess who got the leprosy now? Gehazi. So, verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through the craving for money, some have wandered away from the faith and they've pierced themselves. That means that they've been impaled on their desire for money. Are you convinced? Some of you don't look convinced. Okay, you need another verse? You need another verse? Verse nine, verse, one verse up. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, a snare means trap, into many senseless and harmful desires. That just means you'll be stupid. You'll step into stupidity and you'll be plunged into ruin and destruction. So we don't need to love money because love and money is going to hurt us. It's going to hurt our spouse. It's going to hurt our children. It's going to hurt the body of Christ. Now, you need to know this. This is for all of us, but specifically it's for me. Because see, in, in this chapter, the context is speaking to leaders in the church as well. And, and there's been a lot of pastors that have loved money more than the Bible, loved money more than the sheep, and, it's, and it's, it's, caused, it's brought their demise and it's hurt the body of Christ. When I was in college and seminary, our professors would drill this into our heads. They would say, more preachers have fallen because of gold, glory, and girls, female finances and fame. I still remember that. And that is so important because loving money in my life will hurt you. Loving money in your life will hurt all of us. It's not good for us. Fingertips. When God has the fingertips, it's great. When God doesn't have the fingertips, think about what you can do with your fingertips that can send you to prison, like touching the keys and doing things that are illegal, fingertips. Or if your fingertips, you steal something that doesn't belong to you. Or if your fingertips, we could go on and on because the love of money is seductive power. I believe the love of money has demonic strings attached to it. I believe right now as I'm teaching, there's some spiritual warfare going on. I believe some people don't like what I'm saying. I know the devil doesn't like what I'm saying. I know that for many people, this is the area they've never been set free in. And I need you as you're listening to me to also pray for me because this is going to be one of those Sundays that he'll, he'll, the enemy will try to throw a grenade and to divert your attention from the scriptures. Let's not let him do it. So loving money is stupid. Loving generosity is wise. Because if I love generosity, it will protect me from the love of money. If you want to be protected today, be generous. If you don't want the devil to reach you and pull you in and clobber you, be generous. What will keep you out of the reach of the enemy? Generosity. Not only does generosity protect you, it will bless you. A couple of verses I want you to look at. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be blessed. Okay, listen to this. In the Old Testament, when the word blessed is used... It's never in the singular, it's in the plural. Remember that. So when I'm generous and when you're generous, God will bless you in the plural. Think multifaceted, think multi-direction of being blessed. Here's another one. Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed in the plural, will be blessed by God. So when I love generosity, it protects me and it invites the blessings of God on my life. Now I have a question for you. If all this is true, why wouldn't your pastor that loves you very much boldly teach you on this subject? If I didn't teach you on this subject, I'd be holding out on you. If I didn't teach this subject to me and to you, then 
I would actually be setting all of us up for the devil to come in and really harm us and for also for us to forfeit the blessings of God on our life. We say this often when we talk about generosity. Generosity is more about not what God wants from you, but what God wants for you. If you can reprogram your mind and if you can reposition your heart that when Pastor Jeff teaches our church on generosity, it's not about what God wants from us. It's about what God wants for our marriages, for our families, for our children, for our community. So much good stuff comes from generosity. But we got to really work hard because there's this, there's this, uh, false narrative there's this deception that we that comes to the subject of generosity that brainwashes us like a bumper sticker that used to be popular years ago the one who dies with the most toys wins did you ever see that bumper sticker did you ever have it on your toyota bumper bumper uh i know it sounds pretty cool but it's stupid Because you really think that when you die, God's going to say, okay, let's count all the toys. And the one with the most toys gets a gold star. doesn't work that way. Because if I live my life trying to accumulate toys, I make life about me. We make life about us and about our stuff. It's, it's It's almost like we treat life like playing life with the family or Monopoly. You're like, man, I'm telling you, when I play Monopoly with my family, I crush them. Well, I hope you don't play it today on Valentine's Day, sir. Not very smart to bankrupt your wife on Valentine's Day by getting all the Monopoly money. And by the way, when you win Monopoly, wonderful, wonderful. We're so happy for you. Because you know what's going to happen after the game? Everything's going where? Going where? 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 Yeah, in the box. And you know where you're going to go when you die? You're going in a box. Just connect the dots there for people that might not get it. So don't live for stuff. Don't live for, for accumulation. Don't live for this world. 1 John 2, 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This world is not filling. It's just fading. So... How do we not love money? Love generosity. How do we love generosity? It's right here in the Bible. Number one, we need a spiritual understanding. We need a spiritual understanding. Now, when I say spiritual, I'm not using that word like some weird actors and actresses use. I'm spiritual and they're weird. Now, when we say spiritual for us, it means we're biblical. It means that we are under the authority of scripture and we are allowing the spirit of God to lead our steps and to actually reorient our thinking if it's wrong. So Paul says a few things about money. Now we gotta go to verse 17. We were in verse 10. Have you found verse 17? It's in the same chapter, not too hard to find it. Look at it. As for the rich in this present age, charge them, command them, not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who rightly, prov- prov- richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So we're getting some really good biblical meat right here, some spiritual understanding. Here's a few things I want to point out in verse 17. Be a good note taker. Money is temporary. Money is temporary. Money is not permanent. Money is not permanent. It's temporary. Look what he says again in verse 17. He talks about, as for the rich in this, underline it, present age. If you don't underline it, at least put your index finger under the two words, present age. He's telling us something. This world is not all that. We're in the present age, but it won't be here forever because there is a world to come, eternity. So everything around us is temporary. What did you bring into the world when you were born? Nothing but a shiny honey, right? And you're going to leave similar, something like that. (laughs) That's not in my notes, but... 
It's wise because a wise man named Solomon said something like this. I'm reading from Ecclesiastes 5.15. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came. There it is. And shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This is also a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? There's an old Roman proverb that goes like this. There's no pockets in burial clothes. And what that means is when you die, I mean, you know, they might put a beautiful dress on you. They might put a beautiful suit on you, but here's just a pastoral word of wisdom. Leave the jewelry out of the box because nobody can wear it, okay? I mean, wear it. Take grandma's ring. Don't take it. Ask her for it. Don't ask her for it now. That's kind of rude. Pray for wisdom on all that. I'll move on. But whatever's going in the box is staying in the box because it's all temporary. Take a field trip with your family to a landfill, Pewee, take a field trip to a junkyard. Maybe you're seeing the picture now. Everything in life ends up there. All that stuff in the junkyard didn't start the junkyard. It was in somebody's garage. It was in somebody's driveway. It was in somebody's hall closet. It was in some lady's curio cabinet. It was in somebody's basement. But all that stuff goes to the junkyard one day. You ever been in an estate sale in your neighborhood? It's always interesting to go to those estate sales and when you walk through someone's home, you, you, can, you can just have all these imagination, this imagination, there's a story behind every item they're selling. They somehow accumulated that stuff, blood, sweat, and tears. Someone gave them that, it meant a lot, and now you can bargain and buy it for a buck. Let me tell you something, come up close and hear me, ready? You're all renters. We're all renters. Oh, don't rent anything. Buy it on, buy it on. Listen to me. You're a renter and I'm a renter. Everything you got, you're renting because you're going to leave it. It's temporary. You say, well, money doesn't talk. Oh, it talks. What's money say? Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. See ya. Adios, amigos. Yeah, money talks. Proverbs 23, 5, in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will spout wings and fly away like an evil. eagle, evil, eagle. Can anybody identify with that? <laughs> you think I'm high on chocolate or something. I'm telling you, I hadn't ate a piece of that chocolate. Just, I just like preaching on generosity. I'm free, man. So money is also not certain. Write that down. Verse 17, <laughs> nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And how many of us get deceived about this? We think that whatever we have, it's so certain, it's rock solid. Man, this deal is a sweetheart deal and it's unshakable. Only God is unshakable. Only his word is absolute. Only eternal life is permanent. Money is not your provider. God is. Wall Street won't take care of you. Robin Hood won't take care of you. The app. Your employer or employee. We put all of our trust in our parents, our inheritance. But nothing is certain but Christ. Money is not satisfying. That just simply means that when you get money, you'll get thirsty for more. It's like we, in our mind, think, where's my benchmark? When I get there, I'm happy. But we keep raising it. We lack contentment. He would, he would talk about contentment. I'm not teaching this verse, but it's a good one, verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, be content. And that's our problem. We're not content. We just want more and more, and it just makes us unhappy. You ever met a happy, selfish person? Think about it. Have you ever met? I know it's rude to talk out loud in church, but I'm gonna let you do it. Have you ever met a happy, selfish person? No. And if you said yes, you're wrong. 
There are names we never give our children. We never give our daughter the name Jezebel. Come here, Jezebel. I love you, sweetie. You don't give. I've only met one Jezebel in my lifetime. It was a cat in Donaldsonville, Georgia, which I think is an appropriate name for a cat. Don't talk to me after search my cats. And then Judas. We don't use the name Judas. And we never name our children Scrooge. We don't. Now, we know Scrooge, you know, became generous at the end of the story, but we don't pass that name on because he was known to be a miser. Think about the word miserable, and in the word miserable, you'll see the word miser, misery. So when you love money, it will make you miserable, and the reason you're miserable is you're a miser, and in your miser, you'll live with misery. See this sweet and low on the table, this pink stuff? About the only thing I'm missing up here is a coffee cup. But uh, anyway, I grew up in a home that's all my parents used. To this day, I mean, you know, you can get the blue stuff, you can get the green stuff, you can get the yellow stuff. Man, I like cancer in the pack. I don't know about you, but it's just what we were raised with, you know? I mean, go back to my mom and dad's house. He, my dad will look at you funny if you ask for Splenda. There's only one thing that all believers that are going to heaven use, sweet in low. It's pink stuff here. And so I'm just, I've been seeing this since I was a kid. And the reason I got on the table today is I read something interesting. Just a few weeks ago, the man that invented this jumped out of a 16-story Park Avenue townhouse. His name was Donald Tober. Maybe you read the story. He was 89, one of the richest men on the planet. He, he started this. He was a humble businessman, and they said, if you see Sweet and Low in any restaurant, probably Donald called that restaurant and talked him into it because that's what made him great, the one-on-one -on -one phone calls to begin with. And at its zenith, before you know, everybody started reading blogs, finding out this stuff's not good, um, it was in 80% of the restaurants and homes across America. But anyway, a few days ago, Donald Tober, 89, at 5 a.m. in the morning, just a few weeks ago, jumped out of a 16-story window in New York City and took his life. His wife was the editor of, listen, ladies, Brides Magazine. Very prestigious couple. Why did he kill himself? I know during the pandemic, the isolation has driven us all crazy, but maybe even driven some people more crazy than some of us. He had Parkinson's disease and felt like the quality of his life was not what it used to be. A friend said they talked to Tober on the phone the day before, and they said we had the best phone call, and he sounded like himself, and then he ended it all. Could it be that the love of money will never cure what we really need in our heart. And so we've been looking at a spiritual understanding about not loving money, but loving generosity. And I want to transition, and this is where you really got to lean in and listen well, because we've looked at the biblical spiritual understanding. Now I want to spend the remaining of our time in the Word. We need a personal understanding. See, this is when it's going to get real in your grill right now because I've told you what the Word says, but now you've got a choice to make. Are you going to do what the Word says? This happens every week. This happens every time you do a Hear Journal. This happens every time you hear a great Bible teacher podcast. You've got to make a decision. Are you going to audit the lesson? Or are you going to act on the, the biblical truth? And we've got now a, a personal understanding that we've got to wrestle with what does generosity mean for me and what does it mean for you? Pick up verse 17 again. Uh, as for the rich, well, that's not me. The rich. So I can't even make that personal because I'm not rich. Well, I think you are. Because the word actually means to have an abundance. It means to have options and choices. So this morning, when I dressed for church, I wasn't going to wear this shirt. I was going to wear another shirt. And I decided to wear this shirt. It was, it was new. Becky bought it for me for Valentine's Day. 
Did I say times or times? It doesn't matter for today. And so I put on this shirt. I had a choice. I wasn't going to wear these shoes. I was going to wear another pair of shoes. And I'm glad I didn't wear those pair of shoes because when I was worshiping this morning, I looked down at my son and he's wearing my shoes right now. He's got my shoes on. But generosity, fine, son, you can have them. (laughs) He's got my shoes on. But anyway, so I'm glad I have these shoes on because if not, I'd be sock footed this morning. Now, the per- per- I'm just telling you I'm rich and you're rich because I have more than one pair of shoes. So we have choices. We have options. If you have access to a refrigerator, if you have clean clothes on your body right now, if you have a bed or couch you're going to sleep on tonight and there is a roof over your head so all the crazy rain we've had won't wet your body, then you are in the top percentile of the world. You're rich, and I am too. So so I just want you to know right now, verse 17, don't you check out on me. No hall passes are given out right now, none. Not one of you can leave the room and be a hall walker. And don't walk your hall at the house either, you pay attention. Because you all are rich, we're all rich. You may not feel rich, but in the big picture globally, We are very blessed. Amen? Okay, verse 17. God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So let's make this personal. God wants you to enjoy what he's given you. Some people have this faulty teaching that you can't enjoy things. But God blesses you and he wants you to enjoy stuff. Have you noticed some people, they get mad when other people are happy. They get mad when people take a trip to Disney or go on a cruise. You know what? You're so grouchy. Maybe you need a Disney cruise. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need to go to Disney and buy a $29 hot dog with $4 relish on the side to cheer you up a little bit. But what I've noticed is generous people love to see people happy. They love to see people smile. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying things. Becky and I uh, have some friends in this church. All of y'all are our friends. But this uh, particular couple, every now and then, they'll bless us with this gift card to a restaurant we normally wouldn't go to. It is a very, very nice restaurant. And we'll save that card for like a special occasion, like birthday or wedding anniversary. And we'll use that card. And I'm telling you, when we go to that restaurant, that gift card, we enjoy. We enjoy. One thing we do is we pray a blessing. Well, we always, not, it's not like we just pray one. We always pray, pray a blessing. That didn't come out right. But in this blessing, we thank God for the generosity of the couple that blessed us with this gift card. And then we order appetizers. We get the shrimp cocktail in the big old glass. We get the uh, crab cake with the Dijon mustard. We get the Kellogg's fried squid, whatever. We get dessert. We enjoy it. We don't feel bad about it. And see, God, he gives to us. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying. But listen, blessed are the balanced. Some of us enjoy too much. You ask my kids a proverb I quote often. I'll quote them this. They could finish it right now. I'll say to them, have you found honey? Have you found honey? It's in Proverbs. I don't say it like that. Have you found honey? Uh, (laughs) Have you found honey? Don't eat too much or you'll vomit. And then, then you really emphasize that as a preacher. Or you'll vomit. And what I'm trying to teach them is, Honey's wonderful, but too much of anything's not good. We need that balance. See, some of us, we take this enjoyment to the extreme and we make it all about ourselves. No, when, when God is generous to you, enjoy, enjoy. See it as a blessing from God, but don't make your life revolve around looking in a mirror all the time. So God wants us to enjoy. You get that? Write this down. God wants us to share Look at verse 18. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous. Wow, there it is. 
I want to know where in the Bible does God say to be generous? Right there, hoss. Right there. Right there. Right there. Verse 18. To be generous and be ready to share. So this is where it gets real personal. Because ultimately, generosity is always, always a heart issue. Generosity can't be coerced, can't be engineered, can't be forced. Generosity is always a heart issue. So, so when our heart is in a right position and a right posture, we will want to do this. Now, remember when I said, open your Bible to Timothy. Remember that. I told you something about Timothy. I told you it is a church book. It is a church book. It tells, it tells us how to, how to act in church, how to treat one another in church, leaders in the church. It's all about church stuff. So here we're talking about generosity in the church. And we get this opportunity. Now, we can be generous on our own. Becky and I are generous outside of the church, outside of Christ's place. We are generous. And we are generous inside of Christ's place. So, So some of us are very generous outside of our church, and that's good. But here the Bible's teaching balance. Generosity should be also within the church. And what's so amazing is when you're generous and I'm generous and we're generous, we can do a ton together. I love to say this about Christ's place, what we get to do together. What we get to do together, it's a we, it's not a me, it's not a you, it's a we. We get to disciple one another. We get to reach and raise the next generation. We get to live out God's truth. We get to say Christ first. We are banded together. We are force multipliers. We are world changers in our neighborhood. And in a few weeks, we are planning Christ's place north together. You may not be going north, but we are in this together because we come together and we're generous. There is never, there is never an example in the Bible of God's people not returning to him a portion of what he's given to them. You will never, ever find any example in the Bible of God-fearing, genuine believers not being generous in response to God's generosity. Matter of fact, when it's even mentioned in Scripture, there's never a lot of bling to it. It's almost like an afterthought because it would be abnormal for them not to do it. They treat it as normal, like me doing a wedding, and I say, now that y'all are married, you may claim your bride with a kiss. And it's like me stopping and saying, did all y'all see that? <gasps> he kissed her. <gasps> Can you believe? That'd be weird. It's normal. It's going to happen. And so when we are generous, it is normal. It would be abnormal for a genuine, authentic follower of Jesus Christ not to respond to the generosity of God with being generous. So I'm mailing you something this week. I don't know. I don't know. So mail going to run tomorrow. It's President's Day. Probably not. Tuesday or Wednesday, you'll get something. You're going to get a letter from me, and you're going to, you're going to get a card like this. Right now, there's probably one in front of you in the seat back you could look at. And it's an opportunity for all of us to make this personal. It's an opportunity for me and for you and all of us to love generosity. And there's, there's these levels that are here. There's like one, two, three, four, five levels. And, and, and you're somewhere up here. Or you need to be somewhere up here. You're either up here or you need to be. Or where do I need to be? You got to talk to God about that. God will really work in our heart when we live by the fingertips. And so some of us, it's beginning. We, we, didn't, we weren't raised in a generous home. You know, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't share with one another. And this is all new. Maybe you're a brand new believer and you've never heard teaching like this. And you got to begin. And I almost like, if I could like paint some pictures, it's almost like a baby crawling. As a new believer, you're a baby in the Lord. It's like you're crawling, maybe, maybe taking one or two steps. But then consistent means you are past crawling. You are actually 
taking really good steps and you're actually walking. You're not even really falling. You're, you're, you're consistent. And then if I could talk about this tithing level for a few moments right now, I would call this like, I call it like riding a bicycle. Because a lot of us think I could never tithe like when we were younger. I could never ride a bicycle. I don't know how you balance. I'm going to hit a tree. I'm going to hit a light post. It frightens me. There's no way. But once you learn to ride a bike, it just comes natural. And so in this area of tithing, this is really a step that all of us can take and probably should take. And because when we, when, we, when we learn to practice this level, what it's going to do is going to protect you from greed and loving money. And you're going to find yourself, when you learn to be generous, you'll begin to love generosity, and it will reorientate your priorities and, and everything. So, so let me just explain, because some are brand new to church, some kind of rusty on teaching like this. But I think it would really help us to understand about, you know, what, what tithing means and, and, and how to understand it uh, as, a, as a follower of Jesus Christ. A couple of things about tithing. Tithing, the, the red and orange color there you see, tithing is biblical. So that means that I'm not right now talking to you about something that didn't make the cut. It's in the book, okay? I mean, it's like everywhere in the book, especially in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament, but especially in the Old Testament, you just kind of find it everywhere. You find it in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. It's just all in there. And here's the principle behind tithing. When God would say, when you receive from me, I want you to return a portion back to me. That's, that's what it meant. When God said, when you receive from me, I want you to return a portion back to me. Probably the verse we know the best, if you've been in church, is in Malachi. Malachi. And this is what the Bible would say in Malachi. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of heaven, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. So great scripture there about tithing. It's biblical. Write this down. Tithing is more than law. More than law. It's about love. So, I will have people come to me, and they'll look me in the eye, and they'll say, Pastor Jeff, is tithing commanded in the New Testament? And I'll look them in the eye, and I'll say, no, no. Tithing is not commanded in the New Testament. It's not absent in the New Testament. It's just not commanded. Was it commanded in the Old Testament? It was. But it was always more about love than law. It's always more about love than law. So what are we commanded to do in the New Testament if tithing's not commanded? Well, the Bible just says that we're to give out of grace or grace giving. So in the Old Testament, it was about law, regulation. It was about the perfection of God and how he wanted us to be perfect, which we never could. The New Testament is about grace, forgiveness, pardon, not dying and going to hell, but going to heaven, eternal life. So think in terms of grace. And then when you think about giving, if the law required a percentage in the New Testament, it's God saying, give out of love. Give out of love. And so it's, it's not coerced. It's, it's out of love for Jesus Christ. It almost reminds me of the story when Jesus said, to, about the woman that just like lavishly with generosity uh, anointed him with perfume. And he said this. Remember this? Remember this class? Those that have been forgiven much, l love much. Love much. So just kind of think about God's goodness to you and his love for you and, uh, and, and what he's done in your life. And, 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 and don't get so hung up on Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. Because even in the Old Testament, when they would give a tithe, it's based out of love. Abel, his brother Cain and Abel, what did Abel do? He brought a first fruits, that's what a tithe is, a first fruits to God as an act of worship. Abram, before he became Abraham, God took care of him in this bad battle, and it looked like he was going to lose, and God intervened and saved his bacon. 
and he gave a tithe back to the Lord. Jacob at Peniel, he has this vision of a ladder, angels going up, angels coming down. He has this encounter of God, and when he walks away, he gives a tithe back to God. It's always love. It's always love more than law. Tithe means tenth. So if you're like, wow, I'm really going to I'm really going to be generous and I'm going to try this. Okay, it's specific. Because this word tithing, it means tenth. So it means that whatever God gives you, you're going to give a tenth back to him. I mean, that's just what the word means. And so let me make it really, really, really personal. Let's say you make $20,000. That's your salary. And you want to tithe. That means you would give $2,000 in a calendar year, right? And if you got paid every week, you would tithe $38.50 back to God. So that would be a tithe. You're like, Pastor, I make way more than $20,000. Okay, let me, let me give an illustration for you. <laughs> Let's say you make $300,000. Woo. That means you would tithe $30,000 back to God. And that would be $577 a, a, a week that you give back through your church that you love and believe in called Christ Place. You're like, whoo, 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 did they turn the heat on in here? My goodness. You're like, man, I don't know about that. It's kind of like this, you heard this story, this guy comes to the pastor and I'm like, pastor, I love tithing. I'm a tither, but I'm, I'm crushing it at work now. I'm crushing it. I'm making so much money. I don't, I can't tithe. It's just too much money. Will you pray for me? And the pastor, you know, pastors love to pray for their people. Sure, come here. Come on, let's pray together. Come here, brother. Let's pray about this. Dear Lord, He's making so much money, he can't tithe. Would you reduce his salary so he can? Like all you pastors are like, all you pastors are like. You hear about these two guys, they were on a boat sailing and their boat had a terrible accident and they got like marooned on an island. I mean, no one was there. I mean, listen, nobody was there. Not even Tom Hanks was there. I mean, nobody, but they were truly castaways. And one guy is just like nervous. He's all jittery. We're gonna die, we're gonna die. And the other guy, he's like laid back. He's got kind of like, kind of got like a Tommy Bahama hat on. And he's just like got a piece of straw in his mouth. And he's like, you're not nervous? What is wrong with you? He said, I make $100,000 a week. And I tithe. My pastor will find me. So, it's always good to tell a joke when you're talking about tithing to lighten the mood. So, it means tenth. So, you're like, well, Pastor Jeff, do you know what I give? Have no idea. Have no idea. Well, I'm going to tell you. I throw a $10 bill in that box every week. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. If that is based on what God is bringing in, hey, it's legit. But if not, it's a tip. And a lot of times we like, we like treat the same practice like when we give our children, here's a quarter to put in the plate, here's a dollar to take to your Sunday school class today. And I get that for children, but as grown men and women that God has blessed us with, like, but it's a lot of money. Here's some good advice. Don't look at what you're giving in terms of the amount. Look how God is blessing. Don't put the focus on, look what I... I'm giving a lot. Look how God is blessing you with a lot. Tithing is the best way to love generosity. I'm telling you, if you will practice tithing, you will be free from the love of money and you will be actually loving generosity. You'll put God first in your life. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives, says God in his word. You're setting your heart right before the Lord. It will keep you free from the love of money. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. And you are positioning yourself to be blessed by God. That's why everybody should do it. I heard a pastor teach one time. He's wrong. He is so wrong when he said this. He was talking about tithing and he says, now, if you're poor, you don't need to tithe. And if you're a child, you don't need to tithe. And if you're in college, you don't need to tithe. And I'm like, what is that? That dude is preaching from a closed Bible and an empty head. Because here's the, here's the deal. There was a poor woman in Scripture that tithed, and Jesus didn't say stop. 
He said, what faith? You look that up in your Bible. So, so if you're a child and you get Christmas money and you learn to give that back to God, you are setting God, you are, you are positioning yourself for God to bless your entire lifetime. If you're a college student and you make a little money and you don't have a lot, but you are setting that money aside, think about when you graduate and you're looking for a job and what are you praying for? God bless me with a job, bless me with a job. If God can't trust you when you were broke, why would God trust you with a bigger opportunity when he's not even first in your life? The easiest time to tithe is when you don't have a lot because then it conditions your heart to trust him in humility and obedience. Becky and I met uh, February of 1991, I was preaching in the church that uh, her family went to, and she's a student at Florida State University. I was a student at a Bible college down the road, and, and, we, and, we, and we met uh, on that Sunday, and she's telling me she went to Florida State and all. So back in that day, when she, she finished in 91 with her teaching degree, the famous Bobby Bowden was the head coach of the Seminoles. And he held that position from 1976 to 2009. And not only was he a great coach, he's a great Christian. He's 91 today. And uh, I've heard him in person several times. He gives a clear message about following God. I want to tell you a story that he, that he tells, and I want to repeat it uh, because we need to hear it. He said, Bobby Bowden writes, there was a brief period of time when me and Ann stopped tithing. And I'm not proud of it because I forgot what mama taught me. When I left Bill Peterson's staff at Florida State and joined the staff at West Virginia in 1966, I owed so much money from, from raising those six children that all I thought about was paying bills and keeping the creditors away from my door. And I got caught up in poor little old me that I forgot to give that one-tenth to God. And buddy, we just got deeper and deeper and deeper in a pit. That went on for three years, and I knew I was doing wrong, and I knew that money belonged to God, not me, and my conscience was eating me alive as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so me and Ann sat down, and I said, honey, we're going to start tithing. God has given us everything, good health, healthy babies, a home, and we're going to tithe and stick to it no matter what. And he said, and we did, and then something happened. God opened up those windows of heaven and we never look back. When we give God what's his, he gives us way more back to us. It repositions your heart to trust God. You know, some of us get anxious about this talk, and I don't want you to be. I, I really, uh, the last two Sundays, I have felt unusual freedom as I've been teaching you the Bible. We've laughed a lot. Uh, I just believe that God's just given me this like, serenity as I'm preaching. I, I know you love me and trust me. I know that you know I'm not some prosperity preacher and you know I'm not beating you over the head and you know my heart. This is what God wants for us. And I know there's some anxiety with some of us in this room or watching online because we think, I could never get there. That's just too much. I, I could never do that. It scares me to death. 10%, whoo, I missed something. There's a God in heaven that, get, that did not give 10% of his heart to us. He gave 100%. He gave 100% when he gave his only son to come and die in our place on the cross. And you're right. You're like, that's right, Pastor Jeff. I believe it. And I put my faith in him. I have too. Now, here's another question. If you can put your 100% trust and faith in God to get you to heaven when you die, why can't you give 10% back to him to meet your needs? Do you see the disconnect? If I can trust him to get me to heaven, but I can't trust him to help me with all the demands of life. See, this whole subject of generosity, it always takes you back to the cross. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible calls Jesus... The rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. And every time you see a rose, in our mind we should think about 
the generosity of God. Not just giving us a rose. Oh, they always smell so good, don't they? You can smell it from there, can't you? Not just his generosity to give us a rose. His generosity to give himself for us. And when we love generosity, we're just reflecting the very one that made the rose and the very one that gave his heart. So it's personal, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get this in the mail, or maybe you might take it right now, and you got a couple of weeks just to pray through this. And some of us, I, I'm really praying, are going to take this challenge where you see the orange and the red to, 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 to honor God. We, we've been putting down here a 90-day challenge. What would happen if we've got people at Christ's place for three months to say, we've, wow, wow, we've never taken this step, but we're going to love generosity and trust God I can't wait to see what God does in your life. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads for a moment. You know, generosity and the cross, they go together. Generosity and John 3.16, they're married together. Generosity and salvation and forgiveness of sins, they go together. Have you received God's generous gift to you today? For you to know him personally and receive him. You know, to even hear a Bible lesson like you've heard today and to hear it right, your heart has to be in the right place. And the only way your heart, the only way our heart can get in the right place is for Jesus to have our heart. Give him your heart today. Give him your heart. If you want to talk more about that in our connection room, we'd love talk with you online we'd love now to enter a chat with you about what it means to give your heart to Jesus we have an altar today don't be ashamed to use the altar this is a wonderful place to come pray for your my five every week this is a wonderful place for you to say God pastor Jeff said a lot today what is that one thing you want me to take away And I pray for your power and grace to live it out. Use the altar. Come pray at the altar today. It's really a special moment. Father, thank you for the Bible teaching. Help us love generosity. May we not love money. It's not good. But may we love generosity. When we love generosity, we're demonstrating our love for you. When we love generosity, we are reflecting your love. Help us obey the word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.